I'm really delighted to, um, to welcome Jay Pocknell and Peter Bosher to the stage to talk about their fantastic new initiative, um, Sound Without Sight. So um, this is another member of the Creative United family who uh, Mary Alice uh, introduced us to. And um, they've got some really um, important ideas they'd like to share with you. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Peter. Thanks, Peter. So thank you so much to Alex and James and Jacob for inviting us uh, and for organizing this amazing event. It's, it's uh, so far so good, so I'm, I'm sure the rest of it's going to be great too. I'm going to take about five minutes to give you the context of Sound Without Sight, which is what we're talking about, um, tell you how we got to where we are, and then Jay will give you a picture of where we're going. So this is Jay Pocknell. I'll, I'll explain more about who he is and what we're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm totally blind from a baby. I don't always make a point about, uh, about that, but today it does seem relevant. Uh, and I'm kind of a, a sort of a case study. Um, even as a child, I loved recording. I would record plays and music shows with my friends. Uh, I wasn't the actor or the presenter, I just loved recording. Birds, soundscapes, uh, bands, anything that hey, moved, you, basically. How you doing? All right. Um, and I just knew, even then, that I wanted to be a sound engineer. Oh, that's sorted, actually. But people told me that, ble being blind, I couldn't study electronics or electrical engineering or run around making tea in recording studios. And I believed them. So I ended up studying French and philosophy. <laughs> uh, and I, spent, I then spent all my time recording music. We were using an old data storage 16 track, which caught fire at one point, um, and doing stuff for Radio Oxford. I was using razor blades to cut the tape and blue tack to mark edit points. I think I must be in the beyond category that James was talking about. <laughs> Uh, then, then talking computers came along, and I discovered sequencers, uh, audio editors, and what eventually became DAWs. But the point of telling you all of this is that it was really hard to find out how to do this stuff. There was no internet, just tape magazines and the odd lucky hookup. Um, actually, it's still hard to find, even with the internet. And that's a key driver for our project, Sound Without Sight. Um, fast forward to the 2000s, and I went back to college to study sound recording on the Tom Meister course at Surrey University. Um, and on that course, some of the equipment was semi-accessible, with lots of workarounds, and still even using Bluetack uh, to mark places on the screen for on-screen um, mixing desks. I do love Bluetack. <laughs> Um, my work since then has always been a combination of assistive tech and actual recording. So I worked in the studio at Royal Academy of Music, did lots of freelance stuff, and my best ever working time was a studio engineer with BBC Radio Drama, where happily for me, I was forced to learn Pro Tools. So, sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> I now have regular editing work with BBC Radio, and I see that as a, a really small success in the Bob Dylan sense of the success. Bob Dylan says if you wake up each day and do something you want to do, then you can count that as a success. But it's taken me 20 or 30 years. Um, along the way, I've trained other blind people in how to use audio software and music editors like Sibelius and the Dancing Dots solutions. Now, here's the dilemma, performance without barriers, bridging the gap, sound without sight. There are barriers, there are problems. I wish I weren't here, I wish this day didn't have to exist, but there are two ways to approach problems or barriers. One is to whine about how awful everything is, and the other is to acknowledge that there is a problem and trying to find solutions. Should we, as blind people, 
devote our time and energy to finding access solutions and trying to support other blind people, or should we just get on with it? I guess I've tried to combine both, and lots of the people here and lots of the people taking part in this are combining both. I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, in, in 2014 or so, after the uh, Visually Impaired Musicians' Lives Conference, which some of you might remember, it was quite... An, I, know, I know Joe is here from, who was there, and lots of other people may have been there. It was a quite a successful international conference. We ran a pilot which led to the setting up of the Vibe forum of blind musicians and sound engineers and the aim of that was to be a self-help network a bit similar to TAVIP which is the technology association of visually impaired people um, and this came into its own during the pandemic with some good webinars some led by people here today including Scott, Andre and others um, and John. The, the Zoom phenomenon also made it easier to assemble a steering group, which we called Music and Sound with Accessibility. So initially, our, our group was called Music and Sound with Accessibility. Not a very catchy title, but it does say what it, what it does. Um, made, that was made up of some people from the blindness sector, ex-RNIB people, um, including Sally Zimmerman, who will have helped many of the people here. Used, she used to run the music advisory service there. But also people from ac academia, people from the music industry. Um, we came up with a good, clear project um, covering three areas. Audio production, music notation, and performance. And Jay will tell you more, but the point is that we needed a project manager somebody who would wake up each day and do the work. And this is where, as Quincy Jones put it, God walked in the room. Um, and a, a tutor from that Tom Meister course, which Jay had also done, put Jay in touch. Jay is visually impaired. He has experience in the music industry. Old Jay, London grammar, heard of Ring Any Bells? Um, and he was working on a project called Sound Without Sight. And that project had so much in common with ours that we could have filed for industrial espionage. <laughs> but instead, we asked Jay to become the project manager. And now, thanks to some support from TAVIP, the organization I mentioned, and also funding from the Elizabeth Eagle Bot Fund, which is run by RNIB, who, by the way, partly thanks to our previous work, have now snapped up Jay for related work, so he's part-time with RNIB as music support officer. Um, and that work is, is really complementary to Sound Without Sight, so it's, it's all working out really well. Jay is in a fantastic position to take the work forward. The solutions, how you can actually use Pro Tools, Logic, Reaper, and so on, can seem like rocket science. And Scott, Chi Kim, Andre Louis, other people here are the rocket scientists. They're pioneers. So what Scott and others have done for Reaper, Slough Hallerton, Chi Kim and others have done for Pro Tools, Andre and others for Logic. And I'd really like to pay tribute to these people and the hours and days that they've put into campaigning, training materials and so on. It's, we wouldn't be where we are without those people. I really, really want to say a huge thank you to them. We want to bring all of this together to form a knowledge hub and a community and fill in the gaps for other scenarios, so some of the, the more obscure things, some of the, the wider areas that we've talked about, with everyone contributing. So we and teachers and educators and family can tell children and young people, yes, you can be a studio engineer, you can be a producer, you can be a performing musician. So here is Jay to tell you more. Well, I mean, thank you so much, Peter. It's covered quite a lot of this, actually. Um, so we'll kind of skip through this a little bit and, you know, just keep stuff moving. I've got to say, I feel a little bit like Britney Spears with this little kind of side <laughs> mic going on. I'm not, not used to this. And also hearing my own voice. It's very strange. Um, so I think it's worth probably doing a little bit about me, um, just so you're aware of why it's me stood here rather than someone else. Um, so 
Like Peter, I've always been very into music and recording and everything and, and doing it for myself. I, I, I was very aware at a young age that it was possible and I could do it and I started doing it as quick as I could in the local community, meeting you know, bands, artists, open mic nights and festivals and kind of getting them around to record and you know, I guess getting into the world of production, which was amazing. Um, I guess another two things about me are that I'm partially sighted and I'm very stubborn. Um, <laughs> I knew that by hook or by crook, I would end up working in the sphere of you know, the music industry in some way, and I really wanted to make that happen, so I did. Um, I kind of, I don't know, uh, forced it to fit a little bit, I guess, and ended up in that position of doing the kind of London commercial recording studio thing um, quite successfully, worked on some good stuff, which is great, but... I did find once I got there that there were certain barriers that made it slightly more difficult than I was expecting, maybe. Because I think growing up, being partially sighted, you can kind of, you almost have to choose which group you sit with. Like, are you sighted or are you blind? People will find it quite difficult to understand the kind of crossover and, you know, that it is a complete spectrum. Um, and I think finding the barriers later on made me realize that there is some real like representation work that needs to be done in that you know there's really no shame in accepting that partial sight you know it does lead to barriers um so i think rather than getting i don't know feeling forlorn or down or whatever i, I was aware that i was feeling something and i think it was frustration of kind of working to get to the point of working in the industry and it being a little bit more difficult than i thought um so I guess the pandemic came around and the, the industry stuff calmed down for a little bit, um, which was a shame, but it also gave me the space to think about what a project could do to try and address some of those barriers. Um, so that's how we got to where we are now. Um, so I, I guess I started out as a kind of solo one-man band, really, just reaching out within the industry, like my networks, for anyone that was blind or partially sighted or you know, either they're working industry or they wanted to, but they felt like they couldn't for whatever reason. Um, I just did some kind of casual, I don't know, it's not official research because it's not really supported in that way, but it was just conversations really, just meeting people, you know, some people from this room actually, I kind of, I reached out to them, we had great conversations and I kind of collated all of that into a small set of common barriers, I think, um, which I don't want to kind of propagate too much, but I think it's important to acknowledge them, like Peter said, so that we can then find solutions, some of which will be suggested later on in this talk. So accessibility issues experienced quite early on were, were cited, like you know, going through school, some people going through mainstream schools and not being able to access the tools that were on offer. Um, and I think that... Uh, combined with um, this one later on, which is the lack of representation of blind and partially sighted people in mainstream music, kind of led people to believe that they couldn't do it, I guess kind of like Peter was describing. Um, and that's a shame. And those are things that can be changed, definitely. Um, and there was another group of people who found like they had adequate access through school, um, whether that was with assistive tech or just the kind of having a regular meeting on special educational needs or whatever, if, if that was applicable. And that does kind of fall away once you become an adult and you have to access the industry for real. Um, th there is some support available for access to work, but often the people that you deal with, the assessors and stuff, don't necessarily have specialist knowledge in music or in sight impairment. So it's, it's difficult. Um, but again, if there's a way of providing common information and solutions, maybe we can go some way to, to make an, a better situation, right? Um, and unfortunately, things that were reported by people that I spoke to were, I guess, forms of discrimination that no one was really meaning, like no one sets out to discriminate, but quite a lot of uh, kind of job descriptions in the music industry, or even as a freelancer as well, it's like, you must have a driving license, you must you know, get in early and be the last one to leave at the end of the day. And it's not necessarily that inclusive a working style. Um, and again, people reported that they believed that other people got positions above them because they were cited. And that's a shame. So what's sound without sight and how can we try and fix these things? 
Um, so what we're going to start out with is an online platform to kind of support, promote, and connect blind and partially sighted musicians and audio engineers. Um, and it's not setting out to reinvent the wheel. Um, obviously, we're aware that communities do already exist. There's some amazing WhatsApp groups and email groups that, that have been spoken about already today. But they're quite difficult to discover if you're accessing music for the first time and you're not part of these groups or anyone you know is already part of these groups. Um, so if we can create a directory, a way into this world that kind of collates everything together and offers that as a starting point, um, I think that'd be a really good thing. If you can just put into Google or whatever, um, blind and party sighted musicians, and then there's a list of collated resources, that would be great. So we're hoping to kind of make this knowledge hub that the community can contribute to. We're going to be very community driven. Um, I don't pretend to know everything about music and sound engineering and blindness and visual impairment. Like There's so many different things there. But what we can do is offer a platform for the community to contribute that knowledge um, and, as a whole, make a very useful resource. So I guess this is also a call on everyone here um, if you think it is also a good idea to, to get involved. Um, and again, one point I've got on here is that there are lots of pockets of information around the internet and around people's brains that are amazing, but they're quite scattered um, and there's nothing really kind of tying it together and presenting. There might be you know, academic research that's written very academically, which is useful to quite a limited number of people. If we can get a, a friendly way into all the information um, and just lay it out in a, in a really useful way, I think that'd be good. And again, the, the, the online platform that we're proposing is the first step. Um, so it's based on the conversations that I've had and the conversations within the steering group. Um, it's what we feel would be a good thing, but it's not, you know, when we go live with it, it's, it's not the end. <laughs> we want to be very guided by our users and do what is going to be useful for the community. So as Peter said, there's three main areas that we're going to try and support first and foremost based on the research in the group. Um, so the first one is audio production, so access to recording and editing and mixing, things like that. There's music notation as well, um, you know, how that works for uh, blind and partially sighted people, whether that's reading and composing or you know, just getting, use, uh, getting access to music in a format that works for you, whether that might be you know, Braille or mod modified stave notation, um, just being the kind of driving force on making sure that is available <laughs> readily. Um, and then performance as well, um, whether that's access, accessing your instrument or you know, whether you're part of a group or performing on your own, or maybe it's accessing venues themselves and music culture so that you can perform and you know, get to all the events that you want to. Um, and just to skip through this quite quickly, I think, so access to knowledge, obviously it's a problem at the moment. Um, and I think it's also, it can be made more difficult if you're trying to access that knowledge using a screen reader. Um, trawling through Google search results can take a lot longer, for example. So if we can make this kind of one front door um, into all of the useful knowledge, then that's good. Um, and on top of that, we want the website to be really user-friendly for sighted people as well, um, to encourage the use for you know, parents and teachers and anyone really, and also music tech companies to give them, I guess, to make them want to use it really, um, and encourage collaboration across the community and between the community and music tech makers. And another area um, I think is the networking and peer support that a platform like this could provide. Um, again, when I was working, well, I still do work in, in music, but when I was first in the industry, I didn't know where to go for advice around uh, you know, visual impairment and the music industry. And if we can provide that, if the community can come together and offer that, that would be awesome for anyone that's just starting out. And even anyone that is a seasoned pro and they just want to try a new piece of tech. And I think on that topic as well, somewhere for conversations like the ones we're having today to persist beyond these kind of single events that happen, which are amazing, but often the conversation can die a little bit between. Um, so if we can provide a platform to keep this stuff going, then great. 
Um, and again, I guess along with the information, the community itself is quite dispersed throughout the world. Um, at this point in time, you know, this might change if it becomes easier to access music. There's not millions and millions and millions of blind and partially sighted musicians. So if we can create a place where everyone can come together, no matter where they are across the world, to collaborate, then great. Um, and I guess on that as well, if someone somewhere has an idea for a solution, but they don't know how to get it out there, if we've got a place that maybe we have representatives from music tech companies keeping a tab on, that idea might get seen more quickly. Um, so community showcasing, I think, is going to be really important to inc increase that representation, um, to get those role models represented, um, and also share the solutions that they've used along the path to get them there. Um, and I think this will be really important for diminishing the discrimination that people cited as being a barrier. Um, I mean, obviously, everyone that is involved is probably a musician first and foremost. I don't want to kind of lean too heavily on the, on the visual impairment side of things, but I think at this point in time, it's good to recognize the, the massive talent that does exist within our community. So one example here, Olga Koiva. So she is Bulgarian, currently living in Germany. Um, I found her through the steering group. Um, and just two pictures here on the left. So these are both from the same concert. Um, so she's a soprano and a organist and pianist as well. On the left, she's using a She's, she's singing and she's using a braille display to, to sight read music, braille music, um, which is pretty mind blowing to me. <laughs> um, and it's something you just don't see, like even at music tech events, you don't see that kind of, I don't know, access to notation is never really a thing. It's always how do we access DOWs and stuff like that. And I think there's a whole other world that needs extra representation. Um, and also, you know, we, we've got a really good team between us, and we want to create more content to fill the gaps where there are gaps. Um, and that might be things like promoting the, the new research and development that's happening. You know, if we can get music tech companies to promote that directly to it to their user base, then stuff might happen more quickly. Hopefully. <laughs> so, how is it going to be kind of set out? Um, We've got a first prototype at the moment of the website, and that's kind of split into three community areas. So one is the Knowledge Hub, kind of like a wiki, where anyone that has an account with us can uh, contribute to the Knowledge Hub. Um, there's also a Q&A section, a bit like Stack Exchange or Quora, where someone can come and ask a question and get a quick response from the community um, on a specific thing. Um, there's also a forum for kind of ongoing discussions for, for bigger topics, I guess. Um, and beyond that, we're going to have the kind of editorial content, um, curated content and news to, I guess, keep the whole thing going and give a platform to, I guess, stakeholders and music tech companies, people like that, to, to promote what they're doing. And there's also going to be kind of a site-wide search to, to give users like easy access to all of those areas in Unison. So where are we at now with the project? So Peter explained we, we got a, a little grant from RNIB, which is great. Um, and that's to get you know, the first version of the website online, the public launch, which is going to be hopefully early next year. We're looking at February at the moment. Um, um, at this point in time, we're kind of reaching out to other organizations and companies and stuff and trying to get their buy-in, basically, <laughs> um, and see who can help us promote the thing and you know, who agrees that it would be a, a, a good project, because um, I think it would be a good project. <laughs> um, and we're also after, after testers to help us test and shape the initial launch of the project. So if you feel like you'd like to help with that, then come and have a chat. And just to say that the launch will be just the first step, and you know that's not the, the end of it. We're going to be guided by user feedback beyond that point. Um, so a few organizations that we're really, really thankful for their help. Um, RNIB is one. I mean, Peter mentioned that since all of this has happened, I've actually <coughs> become employed by them at the same time. So <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the music support officers, along with Daisy, who's sat at the front here. <laughs> um, Peter, so when, um, when Jay finishes off.
there's some synergy there, um, which is great. Um, so the Technology Association of Visually Impaired People are the kind of official host of the project on the sight loss side of things, which is great. Very thankful for that. And on the kind of arts organization side of things, we've got Creative United. So thank you, Mary Alice, for, for sorting us out on that. Um, and the Technology um, in Music Education UK organization as well, they've kind of committed to help us uh, get the project uh, used in schools as well and, and promoted there. So I won't go through everyone because I know we're a bit short on time, but just to give a flavour of our steering group who we've got involved. Um, so obviously we've got Peter Bosher, um, who you heard from earlier. We've got uh, the, the DAISY <laughs> consortium involved, and I guess probably the most relevant part of what they're doing at the moment is work around Braille music um, and how can that all be pulled together and made into a more international project. Um, so very, very appreciative of all their, all their support. Um, Steve Tyler from Leonard Cheshire, James Risden from ABRSM, um, obviously great, great names, great organisations to have involved. Um, Dave from RNIB, so he's uh, a lot more on the kind of customer experience rather than specifically music, and he has great insights on making venues and things like that accessible. Um, Matthew Horsepool as well um, from UCAF, he's their Braille expert and kind of specialises in the music area. Um, so yeah, great. Uh, and beyond that, we're kind of we're in touch with several quite esteemed academic researchers and also people from music tech companies. So that's great. And there's just a note there asking um, anyone here. We would love to hear from anyone who thinks this is a, a good project and, and get you involved. So that's that's a little summary of Samuel Outside. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? Um, and do we have time for questions, Alex? I guess is a big yes, question. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please do far away. I'll just bring uh, Peter back over to the to the stage area. And um, there you go, Peter. Just um, just in front of you there is a chair. Okay. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, brilliant. Yeah. So, is there any questions at all from from anyone here or or online? John. Yes. Let me grab the microphone. Sorry. One second. Um, <coughs> There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, sounds like an exciting project. Um, I want to urge you, from the point of view of a live sound engineer, to uh, to include stuff about live work because mm -hmm. uh, it's great to talk about doors and all that. It's marvelous, but but there is a live side to things. I I work as a live sound engineer, and I'm currently mm, trying to tackle the idea of how to use a digital desk in a live situation. I think um, to reflect the question back at you, John, is would you be interested in joining the community and kind of offering insight onto all those things? Because this is a very malleable project and we want to support as wide an area as possible. I but absolutely would. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely. <laughs> well, in that case, you know, what you have I done? Heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th th this is it's, it's the community, really. Um, we, 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 we want input from everyone. No, it's great. Um, <laughs> does anyone else want to ask a question? Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Maya. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question is if you can uh, tell us more about the um, music tech uh, people who are in, in touch with you, like what... Uh, Companies will you contact, or maybe you managed to contact uh, already? Yeah, so we can't kind of we don't have any official partnerships. I guess that's that's the official line. Mm -hmm. um, so we are in contact with you know by hook or by crook most of the big names that you would have heard of, but we don't. I guess we can't announce anything officially at this point in time, um, just to say that. I think all of the big names that have been mentioned so far today have been involved in some way, um, and you know, conversations ongoing. And we we can say Daniel Spreadbury is here today from Steinberg, who's been very supportive of the group. So, thank you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, any more? It is, is it worth also saying? I mean, Jay has been in touch with Focusrite with. Um, Avid with other people, so it's 
it's already those those kind of networking things are already happening and um uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, Jason, who is going to be talking later, I think. Jason uh, arranged a, 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 an industry symposium a while ago, which was a, a great way that helped us get into some of those networks. So th that's already happening. I guess, yeah, just to also flag, I've just come from the audio developer conference where obviously loads of key people from, from key companies. So <laughs> there have been a lot of conversations had over the last couple of days, but I guess nothing official that I can announce right now. Um, but yeah, thank you. There seems to be a real kind of buzz around your stand and also Jason's stand. So I think it's a real, um, there seems to be some momentum, I think, building up in, in accessibility in the music tech industry, which is really encouraging to see. Um, Guys, so Jay, Peter, thanks so much for sharing um, your ideas with us and your projects, and we'd love to sort of feed into that um, uh, from the Bridging the Gap project. So, so yeah, we have a chat about that as well. But um, thanks so much. A big round of applause for these guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>